excited to announce our next speaker, our keynote speaker for lunch. Many of you know him, Guy Benson, the political editor at townhall.com. He's also the host of The Guy Benson Show, a lot of that airs in both Chicago and DC. You've probably seen him on everywhere from Fox News and uh, charging to the depths of MSNBC, single-handedly taking on three liberals at a time on the uh, Ed Schultz Show just last week. Uh, but he's one of our more prominent uh, contributors and uh, commentators on the right. We're very proud to have him with us today. Please give a big round of applause for Guy Benson. Thank you so much, Eric. Have you guys seen, just before I get into the substance of what I want to say, have you guys seen this Obama wedding registry thing? <laughs> yeah, you see, I mean, if, if you're uninitiated, the Obama campaign is desperate for cash at the moment, and they're suggesting on their website that if you're getting married between now and the election, that you forego wedding gifts and ask your guests to donate to Barack Obama instead. I'm not making that up. Um, and I wrote about that last night. One of our commenters at Town Hall had a great line. He said, Barack Obama is the gift that keeps on taking. <laughs> and then I was just perfect. So one of the rules of public, can you, can you hear me OK? Or is, is, is this one better? No. No. One of the rules of public speaking is when you start a speech, you want to ingratiate yourself with the audience. You want to get the audience to sort of like you a little bit, um, come across as likable. And I've always been a rebel by nature, so I'm going to break that rule right now and tell you that I stand before all of you today as a lifelong fan of the 27-time world champion New York Yankees. That one. Um, and, and, and here's the thing, though. What might separate us on sports, whether it's Bucky Dent or Aaron Boone or even Kurt Schilling, uh, what we share in common here is a united love of country, liberty, and the Constitution. And at the end of the day, those things matter a lot more than baseball, although baseball matters a lot, especially up in this neck of the woods. Um, my plan is just to speak for a few minutes, and I'd be happy, to, if we have time, to just to take a couple questions. Citizen journalism is kind of a, a modern media revolution. People talk about the old days where it was three networks and a few, like a tiny, a tiny handful of newspapers that could dominate the media narrative. That is ancient history. I would even say that the days where talk radio and Fox News had overwhelming influence, those days are waning, they're receding, although their impact is still vast we're kind of pushing into a new frontier, buoyed by technology, and I think a growing and richly earned distrust of the ruling class, and a, a simmering anger at the existing media for not doing its job, be it out of laziness, or cluelessness, or elitism, or rank partisanship, or some combination thereof. So the iconic American turn of phrase, we the people, which of course is in the preamble of the Constitution, it has been refreshed I think recently, in the last decade or so, with new meaning. And you guys are a part of this revolution, which I think is very exciting. But it also comes with some degree of responsibility as well. So what is a citizen journalist? Part of my own background is I actually went to journalism school. I attended Medill at Northwestern University. I was one of like four conservatives in the school's history, I think. Um, and now I am in a very blessed position to be a paid, salaried writer and analyst for townhall.com, which I hope you check out regularly. Um, and I have the opportunity to do radio and, as Eric mentioned, uh, television and that sort of thing. But I view my role as that of telling the truth and offering the sharpest opinion and analysis that I can muster, while also openly acknowledging, not hiding, my own biases. I think that's one of the biggest sources of corruption in the mainstream media is they are biased. Everyone seems to know they're biased, but they just doggedly refuse to admit it, which I think is, uh, they talk about transparency, but they're not even transparent about themselves and their own beliefs. That's a key difference with the mainstream media. But, you know, some of us are in a position where we are full-time working journalists, but that applies to very few of you, if any, in this room today, that's because you have another role, at, the, at least in this stage of your life, uh, to be playing. Not everyone can be Rush Limbaugh. Not everyone can run for office. 
You're here to equip yourselves with the tools to make a difference here in Massachusetts and around New England, in your local communities and in your state. Um, and I can't overemphasize this. Local and state reporting and digging and cleaning up the mess is so important because people tend to get really excited about the big national stories, and they are important. They're very important. But other stuff goes by the wayside. And people closest to those stories have to be the ones to do that hard work. And that's why you all are, are here today. Um, think of it this way. What might be tomorrow's big national story probably is going to start at the state and local level. Someone doesn't just become the president or the speaker of the house in the blink of an eye. They, they come from somewhere. Where does the left groom their leaders of tomorrow? And the answer is at the local level, probably a lot of them in this state, unfortunately. But they don't, they don't kind of poof, materialize out of nowhere. Even this president didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, he managed in 2008, in my opinion, to sort of be an enigma with all this mystery about his background and schooling and all sorts of stuff that I think we still don't have a full handle on. How was he able to do that? Because people at the state and the local level in Chicago didn't have the energy or the tools or the wherewithal to do that digging when it might have done some good. By the time 2008 rolled around, it was far too late. There was a narrative. He had crafted a background for himself. He had crafted the story that he wanted to be told. And once he took off, it was all sorts of retrospective, last minute kind of frantic seeming digging by people on our side, where a lot of voters just didn't want to hear about the layers. It seemed like, oh, the, the right is getting desperate. Doesn't matter that it was all true. The fact is he was able to progress to a certain point without being challenged. And I, I'd love to talk to you another time about the way he got uh, even to be a senator in Illinois. It was unbelievable, his path to power and the way he did it. So that was a failure of local and state bloggers. And oh, that didn't really exist. It was another era back then, in the mid-90s. We've come a long way. So I'm not necessarily casting stones at conservatives in Chicago. Trust me, they have their hands full. Um, and I say that as someone who lived there for seven years. So what are some examples? It, it's, you, you've all, you're all here today, which says a lot. And you're getting some great presentations. I've been sitting in the back and just so many useful tools. That FBI file thing I never knew. It was fascinating stuff. But sometimes you might feel frustrated, like, you know, what, what can I actually do here? Is this really worth my time? And the fact is, let me just give you some examples, just a few examples of citizen watchdogs and just average people impacting major races and major stories in this country. Of course, you have the early pioneer like, like Matt Drudge in the 90s. But I, I think, and he's a major powerhouse today. I, I assume everyone here at some point reads the Drudge Report. I mean, it's, just, it's one of those sites you almost have to click on every day just to see what he's up to, what his headline is, if there's flashing lights or whatever. Um, I, I think a big watershed moment in this revolution I've been talking about was 2004. I'm sure many of you remember this story. Leading into the 2004 presidential election, when President Bush was up for re-election, CBS and 60 Minutes ran that story that said that they had these memos that President Bush had used special connections to finagle his way out of the Air National Guard service that uh, he was legally required to be involved in. And this was a big, embarrassing story for the Bush campaign. Well, that was 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes on CBS News, the gold standard of journalism. No, really. I mean, if, if, if you talk to journalism professors and students for decades, you said, what is the gold standard in television journalism? 90% of them would say, CBS News, 60 Minutes. And they ran a story that was very, potentially very damaging to President Bush. They got brought down, 60 Minutes got brought down by internet commenters. This, this was fascinating. There was a typewriting expert in, I think, Montana, who posted a comment on a website that said, this font doesn't seem right. Typewriters couldn't do this back then. There was an attorney in Atlanta who also started posting comments on another conservative website. And this thing build, uh, built and built to the point that CBS was all of a sudden fighting allegations. They were in the spotlight. And you had a, 
CBS newsman Dan Rather standing by the story, and he was ridiculing these bloggers. He said, these are people sitting at home in their pajamas. That's what he said. Well, yeah, they were. But soon thereafter, he became former CBS newsman Dan Rather because he embarrassed himself and embarrassed his organization. The documents were confirmed as forgeries, and the entire thing blew up in the left-wing media's face. And the left was, this was my favorite part, they were eventually reduced to arguing that, okay, the memos were forged, but they're still accurate. <laughs> it was the phrase, fake but accurate, uh, which I think could be the new slogan at maybe the New York Times or, or somewhere else. But that was 2004. What about 2010? Representative Bob Etheridge, Democrat, North Carolina, approached on the street by two college students with a camera. It was in mid-June before the midterm elections. And they said they were asking about policy. Do you support Barack Obama's agenda? He became very agitated. He started shouting, who are you? He was slapping at the camera. And he grabbed one of these kids. This was all on tape. Video goes viral. He totally lost it. So, right, so it goes viral. And he eventually offers an elaborate apology for what he did, but it was too little too late. Five months later, he was former Congressman Bob Etheridge of North Carolina, and he was replaced with a Tea party back nurse named R Renee Elmers in the U.S. House of Representatives, who is pretty much the polar opposite politically of Bob Etheridge. Here were two people going up to an elected official on a public street asking him about his policy positions. He lost his mind grabbed him, the video went off, and he lost his job. And he was one of the 63 House Democrats that lost their jobs in 2010. Same election cycle. Just after Obamacare passed, Representative Phil Hare, Democrat, Illinois, he was confronted by con uh, some constituents after a town hall meeting, and they were pressing him on his vote in favor of Obamacare. They asked, where in the Constitution does it allow you to force all of us to buy health insurance. And he kind of looked like a deer in the headlights, and, and then he eventually said, oh, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and someone said, that's the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and he said, he said, oh, that, I don't, he said, I, that, that doesn't matter to me. He said, quote, I don't really worry about the Constitution on this, to be honest, end quote. On camera, just an average person, the clip went viral. The congressman issued a clarification. <laughs> Seven months later, he was former Congressman Phil Hare of Illinois, and he was replaced by a local pizza parlor owner and a father of 10 named Bobby Schilling, who has a very different voting record than his predecessor. Average people making a difference, part, helping to create the wave that swept across the country in 2010. <coughs> It, it's, and by the way, those guys were in safe-ish districts for their party. In fact, if you look at Phil Hare's district, it is so wildly gerrymandered, it was designed to protect him. And in North Carolina's 2nd District, that was one of the safer districts, they thought, in North Carolina for their side. But because politicians were asked legitimate questions by members of the public, questions that the mainstream media, weren't, they weren't even there. there. There was no press there. It was just a camera, and then YouTube. They lost their jobs, and these things were in TV ads used against them. You never know what you do might end up on national television. Now, I heard a rumor that you guys have something of a contested Senate race in this state, I think, <laughs> this year. And so, my family actually has a house in Massachusetts, a little, a little east of here. And so sometimes people back in DC think I have some sort of special insight onto the Brown uh, war and Senate race, and they ask me, you know, what, what's going to happen? And I tell them, I don't, you know, I don't know, I, I've talked to Massachusetts voters when I'm up there, and they seem to generally support Obama, but they really seem to like Scott Brown as well, and he's, he's got pretty good popularity ratings and that sort of thing, but I'm not really sure. I think Brown will probably win, but uh, people will split their tickets, but I don't really know it's going to be close. And so they say, well, how, sh how sure are you? I say, barely. They said, well, give me odds. How sure are you? I said, maybe 132nd sure at best. I said, I have no proof of that. 
It's just, it's just part of who I am, part of my story. <laughs> By the way, when, when that story jumped the shark, I've been writing about your Senate race at Town Hall because it's just so funny. The, when, it, when it jumped the shark was, the, was, was Pow Wow Chow, right? So this is her proof, right? Well, I contributed recipes uh, to a not ironically named book called Pow Wow Chow. Uh, and I was like, are you kidding? And then it turned out that at least one of them was plagiarized from a New York Times wire story from like the 70s. So I was like, gosh, how did anyone figure out that was a plagiarized recipe? And then I realized some of the ingredients for this dish were like, you know, Worcester sauce and fresh crab meat, which was clearly abundant in 19th century mid-Oklahoma, right? You could get all, oh yeah, I'll just go down to the local teepee and pick up some fresh crab meat to make my crab dip or whatever it was. I, I honestly can't believe it. <laughs> that uh, you guys probably have followed this even closer than I have, but we're getting a big laugh over it um, around the country, although you know, a nervous laugh, because the race is still obviously very close. Uh, but on that front, on that race, a friend of mine back from Chicago, Ann Sirock, was at Eric's event in uh, Eric and the Heritage Foundation in Franklin, put on this thing in Provin uh, Providence a few weeks ago, at, to coincide with Netroots Nation, which is their big left-wing conference every year where Elizabeth Warren is a rock star. They, they love her there. She won the presidential 2016 straw poll. They wanted to be president. Um, and so Anne showed up with a camera and decided to ask a question of Elizabeth Warren. She said, uh, ma'am, do you consider yourself to be an inspiration to other women of color? <laughs> Elizabeth Warren ran away and ran up an escalator, and it's on tape. And it makes her look evasive for some reason. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's another example. They don't like, and this is, this is not just Democrats, or, generally people in power don't like being asked inconvenient questions. And my experience, my own opinion, is that I think the media does a better job of asking inconvenient questions of one side than they do of the other. So there's a need to compensate, and that need, I think, is recognized by, obviously, the people in this room, which is why you're here. Finally, one more story on this. How many of you have heard of my colleague at townhall.com, Katie Pavlich? Yes. Yeah. Handful of you guys. She literally has written the book on Fast and Furious. It's called Fast and Furious. <laughs> And it's, it's just huge, huge news this week for, for you know, major reasons, justifiably. Um, Fox News has picked up on this. It's been all over talk radio. In fact, one CBS News reporter named uh, Cheryl Atkinson has actually gone after this really hard. To her credit, she won a Pulitzer. She won a Pulitzer for this. Going after the White House and the Justice Department, she has gone on record saying she calls and asks questions about Fast and Furious, and they berate her profanity-laced tirades that she's even asking these questions, which to, a, to average reporters and to citizen reporters, you start to get a sense, if they're screaming at you on the phone that you're asking about something, you want to ask another question. And so that's what she's been doing. But this is now a, a national story. Where did it start? It started with local bloggers on the ground in Arizona talking to local whistleblowers from the local chapter of the ATF who weren't happy with what was happening. This was a very grassroots level story. Katie is from Arizona. She started reading into this, and she said, this seems interesting. She started following it uh, intensely over a, a period of months, and what started with a few whistleblowers and a few very local bloggers in Arizona has now been building and building and now culminating next week the House of Representatives may very well hold the Attorney General of the United States in contempt. Think about that. <laughs> uh, it took like 18 months. This, sometimes stuff happens overnight. Phil Harris says he doesn't care about the Constitution. It goes up and he pretty much dooms himself. Sometimes it's a long slog and it takes patience. But now everyone knows about Eric Holder. At least a lot of people do. NBC News viewers are finding about it for the very first time, finding out about it, because they were, they've been trying not to cover, but now there's this contempt citation, the contempt hearing. 
And he's been, he's been uh, stonewalling and lying and misleading. They've had to withdraw two letters from Congress. I mean, it, it, this is a big mess for them. Now, what's interesting is, while that whole abomination has been coming to a head, there's been sort of another story that hasn't gotten quite as much attention, but it's all these national security leaks coming out of the Obama administration, all of which just curiously cast President Obama in a very positive, macho light. And there are some people, not just Republicans like John McCain, but also Democrats like Dian Dianne Feinstein in California who are looking at this and saying this is really a problem. Um, because we're giving up, someone is giving up very valuable intelligence to the press, and therefore also our enemies, because they can read the newspaper, stuff about what we're doing internally, projects, operations. Why? Who's doing this? There are people looking into that as we speak. So I was watching Hannity maybe two weeks ago, and this was the topic of conversation, and Sean had Michelle Malkin and Juan Williams on as guests. And Juan is a great guy. I think he's generally a, one of the more intellectually honest guys on the left. I, I really like and respect him in general, but he was, you know, Malkin was just relentlessly telling the truth as she typically does. And he was getting frustrated with her, so he denigrated her. He said, look, this is just one way. I'm a real journalist, not a blogger out there in the blogosphere. And you know what that said to me? That said to me, eight years later, after Rathergate, they still don't get it. <laughs> Citizen journalists and bloggers make an enormous impact, and no amount of wishful thinking on the left can make that go away. And I think that is so important. And that's why training sessions like these are crucial. The left has been honing their organizing and activism skills to perfection for decades. They really are very good at this sort of thing. They are. They have these turnkey foot soldiers, too, with public sector unions. They can mobilize at the drop of a hat. And I think our side is playing a little bit of catch-up. But as we saw in Wisconsin, the left can be defeated at their own game. And they were defeated at their own game in a major way in the Badger State. So I think Franklin, the Franklin Center, should be commended for doing their invaluable work at the state level, where they're standing in the gap where the mainstream media, which is just kind of decrepit and sclerotic, they've fallen down. There is, um, there is a space now that the Franklin Center is filling. But I also want to say, <coughs> That when I go around and I get talks and I, I chat with radio callers or commenters or whomever, a lot of people say, you know, I'm so worried about the country. I'm so worried about the direction of our leadership. I wish there was something I could do. This is, you get this a lot, I wish I could do something. And voting and donating to candidates you agree with, that's all very important and great, right? But let me put this as simply as possible. We do not win without citizen activists and journalists, period. Doing that hard work at the grassroots level. It's just uh, instrumental, it's invaluable, and you can't really replace it. TV ads are great, they're gonna bring information to some low information voters, but unless there's a ground game, the, the ads themselves aren't gonna win an election. So, I, I just, I have to hand it to you. Everyone in this room got off their ass and out of the house this morning to come to a room with one window on a Saturday for eight hours, the equivalent of a work day, on a Saturday, to sit around and listen to people like me talk. I mean, that is such a huge commitment that you guys have made, but it, it's so, so important. A lot of people that I work with in like kind of the New York, DC corridor, um, we, we get the sense that, oh, we write a column, or we go on television, and we make such a big difference. And you know, sometimes we do, but we do not and cannot make the difference, right? All the bloviating and talking, and even if it's true or interesting or funny, all of that stuff combined cannot replace what happens at the state and local level, people working hard, and that's what you guys are doing. So I want to close by thanking you for being here today because God knows this state needs help. <laughs> and, and you're here to do it, so thank you.
for a couple questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to set up this question by pointing out that Rob Eno's red mask is a terrified blue mask. Um, can you give us a spot evaluation of the correlation of forces? Well, how up is the left on these organizations? I go to Blue Mask and Black, and we're told, and then I go to Rob, so I don't know how, you know, how good Blue Mask Group is it. opposite Red Mask Group. But do you know, you know, nationally, well, when you look at these, what I think was interesting, much, how much citizen journalism, how, uh, how many um, non-standard uh, you know, media are right. up on? How, right. How and, and it's not just media; it's it's all sorts of activist organizations. There is there is a book he was mentioning in Colorado earlier, and this this. Okay, so he's just he's he's saying how is the the right generally keeping up with the left in all of this stuff, activism, journalism, uh, kind of uh, grassroots level uh, activism or whatever you want to call it, journalism. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tough question to, to answer with specificity. I will say, and he brought up Colorado in his presentation about how there's this splinter group here now, but it's based in Colorado, called Colorado AstroTurf. If you wanted to read a really scary book after the 2008 election, it's called The Blueprint. It's a book about what the Colorado left did to turn their state from red to blue. And it was, it was brilliant. It was very well funded. It was extremely subversive and ruthless. Ruthless, ruthless, ruthless. And they, and they did it. They won, they, Barack Obama won that state in 2008, and then they held a tough Senate seat in 2010, despite the headwinds. And so I read that book um, after the 2010 election, which was a relief. If I'd read it in 2009, I might have just like jumped off a building, because it was so depressing, because they were trying to replicate this all over the country, and they still are. I will say, between 2008, when we got our butts kicked, just, just destroyed, not just not just in the vote total. I mean, they killed us online. Killed us, killed us online. Especially among people my age. It was a bloodbath. We have caught up a lot. Twitter has been huge. We've, we've been very good on Twitter. And we've had organizations starting to pop up where people on our side say, holy crap, it's time to get serious. Seeing that they never relent. They never, it seems like they never sleep. They're constantly figuring out new ways to destroy the country. Um, and that's, that's why, you know, I said Franklin Center, and I'm kissing up a little bit because they're putting on the event, but Franklin Center is a perfect example of something that did not exist a few years ago, and now it exists, and it's attract, attracting 100 people in the middle of Massachusetts on a Saturday in June. You know, and so I, I would say I can't quantify it for you, but I can say we're, we're catching up, but by no means have we overtaken them. No way. Yep. Looking around the room, where are the under 30s? Where are the under 20s? Raise your hand if you're under 30. There's a couple here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine of us. Now, let, now let's be honest. Younger voters tend to, to not necessarily be conservative by nature. But if you look at a lot of the polling data, I mean, look, look at Massachusetts. Massachusetts, I, now I'm going to have to pull these, now I have them somewhere on my computer, but in 2008 in Massachusetts, Barack Obama beat John McCain among young voters, I think it was like 82 to 18 percent. It was just like unreal. Um, Scott Brown closed the gaps with 20 points. In Virginia, where I live now, Barack Obama won over John McCain among young voters by about 18 points in 2008. And the next year, Governor Bob McDonnell, a conservative Republican, won the youth vote by, I think, six or seven points. Now, some of that has to do with turnout. And when I talk to some of my friends my age, not too many of them who were, and I went to a, a pretty liberal college, right, at Northwestern, it's, it's a pretty lefty place. Some of the people who were most on fire for him in 08 they're not necessarily Romney supporters all of a sudden, but they're just not all that excited. They're not donating. They're not volunteering. They're 
oh, did I, have I registered to vote? I don't really know. I think you'll see a drop off in participation and enthusiasm, and I also think you'll see the gap close a little bit. So I think it's a, I think it's a pipe dream at the moment to think that um, our side, not to get too partisan here, because I know Franklin isn't, but uh, I think that the youth vote will not flip, but it will narrow, and the advantage will be significantly diminished uh, year over year from 08 to 2012. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak to the, um, the, the, the role of being glib and clever and cynical as opposed to and the conservatives have a reputation of being entirely too civil, thank you very much. And I, and I guess, um, is there, can you give us some advice about uh, whether we should raise the temperature of the discussion? It, um, because I think there's many of us who haven't started this process right. yet. But when we saw the tweet out there about, I forget what the heck, oh, afterbirth slime, and that was really insulting to me, and I want to smack him as, his, as a grandmother, you know, but I mean, okay. I, we want to look, keep some, right. keep some, civility, some civility, or because that's who we should be. Yes, look, here, I think that we can fight the left and be ruthless like the left, but I don't think we have to become them, and we never should be, because I don't want to be them. Yeah. I don't want to be them. Uh, and, and I think if we saw... I know this is just kind of like a, a weird little anecdote, but you guys, you saw this viral video this week of the, of the woman on the school bus being bullied by those awful brats. If you haven't seen it, there's this maybe 68-year-old woman, retired widow, uh, who was a, a school bus monitor in upstate New York, um, and there was a 10-minute video from a camera, uh, a, a phone camera, put on YouTube of these maybe six or seven middle school brats just bullying this poor woman for 10 straight minutes, calling her horrible things, and they made her cry. Uh, she just broke down in tears. One of them said, you're so ugly, your children um, should kill themselves. And it turned out her son did commit suicide about 10 years ago. So she, she cried. This video made it out on YouTube. It's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And a blogger, just a random guy, not partisan at all, said, this is horrible. Look at these horrible kids. Let's send this woman on a vacation. Let's raise $5,000 and send her on the best vacation she's ever been on because she deserves it. As of yesterday, they have raised $500,000 for this woman. And she's going to retire. She's going to retire. Yeah, exactly. That sounds like, a, sounds like a GSA trip. Is she single? But... <laughs> So it, the point of the story is, this country, we, we have our faults, our dialogue gets really awful sometimes. But at the end of the day, we still value civility and basic kindness. And so I think you can get, sometimes snarkiness helps, sometimes it hurts. I think it depends on what your personality is. Everyone kind of thinks they're funny. Some people are, some people aren't. But if you are genuinely, like Mark Stein, if Mark Stein were to do like a very dry, boring delivery, he'd be wasting the immense talent that he has. His humor works. Now, if you're snarky for just for the sake of being snarky and, and nasty seeming, that's probably going to turn more people off. So some of it has to do with just self-reflection. What kind of person am I? What works for me? But the number one root of everything needs to be fact and truth, always. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I want to go back for a minute to the question about where the under I'll tell you where they are. They're at the Ron Paul rallies. Mm. Uh, any, as, as the Ron Paul candidacy presumably will be coming to an end, any advice for keeping those people engaged in, in promoting uh, freedom in this country? It's the Ron Paul crowd can be, can be tough. And, and this is my own opinion, not that of Franklin or anyone else, because I know that I can be partisan, they can't. Um, Ron Paul, there's, there's a certain segment of Ron Paul supporters who will not support anyone who is not named Ron Paul, right? Like, they just won't vote. They will not vote in the election anyway. Some of them will go to Obama, believe it or not, but a lot of them won't. And I think the way to talk, and this isn't true of just Ron Paul supporters, it's true of anyone who has sympathies with our side, so to speak. You look at the choices that we have, and you say, okay, you supported Ron Paul, you really probably detest what Mitt Romney says about this and that and the other, right? And we can have that discussion, 
and, and let's, let's talk about it, but there's a choice to be made, right? We're, it, this is not, we can't just uh, anoint someone leader. There's going to be a choice that has to be made in November. And so if you ask a Ron Paul supporter, what do you think of Obamacare? What do you think of more government spending? What do you think of QE3 that's coming? What do you think of the, the spending levels? What do you think of the debt levels? There's a choice. Which of these people is, and sometimes you have to say, which of these people is less bad? Now that's not my view of Mitt Romney, but a lot of people will look at this as a, a, an evil versus left, uh, less evil. And I think that make a very intellectual argument and, and force them to think about it through that choice. And they might say, well, I hate the choice. You say, okay, work to change the paradigm throughout your lifetime. But for now, you have a choice. And we can't afford frittering away, you know, just blathering on and on about how we have to change things. Let's make the choice now because there's a task at hand. That's what, that's what I would do. That's what I have done. And don't forget that there's, if this is a broader coalition, there's also stuff that they're really going to, you know, that they're going to agree. Ron Paul is a very strong pro-lifer, for example. And you know, there's a very clear choice in this election on, on that type of issue. So try to find areas of agreement and try to persuade. I don't think it's helpful saying, well, Ron Paul's a nut. He's, he's got a son who's a very popular senator who's maybe a little bit softer in his tone, but that guy's an up-and-comer. I was, I was at CPAC in Chicago to speak a few weeks ago, and he got a big welcome, Rand Paul. That guy has, has some big plans. So, you know, I, I really, I support running certain people out of the movement. If, if, if you come across a, a flagrantly racist person, you're not welcome, in, in my view. But if you have some apostasies or difference of opinion in some things, like I hate the impulse sometimes to say, well, this person isn't a true conservative, so we don't want you. I want anyone who's going to help us move the ball forward on liberty. So. Can I, what would your message be to, uh, for, for conservatives to give, or for citizens and reporters, to the 46 million people on food stamps mm -hmm. and the 26 million people that are desperate and don't have a job now to, con to consider not voting for the Muslim in chief. Oh, well, I, I, Barack Obama's not a Muslim. Um, really? Yeah, he's, he's, he's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. I don't, I, he's, he says he's a Christian, and I also think it's totally irrelevant. I don't, I, don't care, I don't care what his religion is. I care about what his policies are, and they, in my view, have been overwhelmingly disastrous. Um, so, what do you say? What do you say to some of those people? Um, I think if someone doesn't have a job, and they look at us plunging deeper and deeper into debt in order to stimulate the economy and it's doing nothing for them, it hopefully is a, a, not that tough of a sell. Like, we're doing something really wrong here. I think the debt is a much bigger issue than the president realizes. I think behind jobs, debt and deficits may be issue two or three behind Obamacare. I mean, it is way, way up there. I think the debt is a big one to talk about. Um, and, and your first part of the question on food stamps, okay, there are, there's a certain segment of the population that has totally bought into the dependency thing, and I think that we have to fight that like the plague. But I think there's a lot of people, like I, my best friend from home was unemployed for 14 months. He just got hired, thank God. He just got a great job, and I'm thrilled for him. But he was on unemployment for 14 months, and I can tell you he took no joy. We would talk about this. He, he hated it. I think there's a lot of people who are on the government doll who do not want to be on the government doll and say, let's not talk about, oh, draconian cuts by this party or whatever. You want to, I think it's interesting, the president, have you heard him? He says this a lot. He says, uh, the, other, the other side wants people to fend for themselves. You know, it's just, they just, these people have to go fend for themselves. And I think that it's important to have some sort of safety net to help people who can't help themselves. Um, but I think this country was founded on most people fending for themselves, thank you very much, with the government being out of the way. I don't think it's a dirty word at all. And I still, I still believe that's alive in most people in this country. They want to be doing well for themselves. They don't have to, they want to wait for a, a paycheck or a food stamp check from, from Barack Obama. Sir. What's more important, conviction or compromise? Compromise. Yeah. The question is, what's more important, conviction or compromise? 
I don't think it's an either or, and it depends what your role is. So if you, if you are, um, I, th I think a guy who balances it really well is Paul Ryan, okay? Paul Ryan, the congressman from uh, Wisconsin, he's the House Budget Committee chairman, he has very strong principles. He also realizes that he's a budget, a, a very important committee chairman in the House of Representatives, and the other house is controlled by the other party, right? So he put out a budget last year where he had a big change to Medicaid policy, a Medicare policy, and it was very controversial. I thought it was totally reasonable. We have to do something major about Medicare. Or else it's going to be completely gone in, I think it's 13 years from now, according to its own actuaries, and you know they don't, they never talk about that, but. For this year's budget, he changed a little bit, partnered with a Democrat, a liberal Democrat named Ron Wyden in the Senate from Oregon, and they, he tweaked his plan to make it a bipartisan compromise. Now, the other side still completely rejected it and demagogued it and lied about it, but the fact is he was willing to take a little bit less of what he wanted to advance the ball. Now, that's one thing. The other, if, you're, if you're an activist... I think there's a role for completely standing by your principles to make sure that I understand, cut some slack to politicians that compromise has to be made, but there's also an incredible importance for people who believe strongly about things to hold people on their own side accountable for the decisions that they make, right? So if, if they feel like they can just coast and they take for granted your support, that's a problem. So I, I, I guess it, de it depends. That's a long way of saying it depends. You know, established leadership, for example, I think they compromise much too much. The what leadership? The establishment. The establishment leadership. Well, I, and, and we can, it depends on what the issue is. I think you have to look at it issue by issue and say, you know, is, is Mitch McConnell, for example, compromising too much here or not there? It's, it's a, I think you have to talk about it one by one, instance by instance, and try to make judgments that way. Sir. Yeah, um, I don't know how widespread you, uh, Teaching race around the country, but you were reading on this open Senate seat that Olympia Snow gave up in Maine. Any ideas on that? Okay, that it's it's again speaking for myself only. Um, that is a blow to Republicans uh, because that was going to be a, a very safe seat. Now, some people might say, "Don't let the door hit you on the way out, Olympia," because she's been frustrating to many of us. Uh, she did vote against Obamacare, by the way, um, but for the stimulus, right? So it's kind of one of those situations, now that she has decided to leave, it's an open seat, it's going to be tough. And my understanding is they have a former governor who's very popular, who's an independent, who the Democrats want to nominate, um, or not really nominate. Let him be an independent with the assurance that he would caucus with them. That, that's the other thing we have to understand. The Senate in particular is all, it's just a numbers game. If you have, even if you've got that Olympia Snow who you don't like, if she counts toward a majority, that determines control of every committee in the Senate. If, if the Democrats have a one-vote majority in the Senate, they have a majority on every single committee, including judiciary and budget and appropriations and armed services, really important, really important committees. And so all that matters is who that guy, if he, gets, if he runs and gets elected, if he caucuses with the Democrats, he is, for all intents and purposes, a, a Democrat. Now, I know that the, there's a little bit of... Uh, there's a little bit of strife up there now because the actual Democrat who is running is like, hey guys, what about me? I'm in your party. And it's a woman too, right? So this is the war on women um, from, the, from the Democrats up in Maine. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. And let's remember that it was the three-way race in Maine that got their current governor elected, who's a strong, like in New England, he's probably the most conservative politician in existence. Um, and he won because there was a three-way race. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. That, that's as much insight as I have on yeah. Maine. There is a Republican. I forget who it is. It's a former. It's like a, a former or current statewide office holder. So it's not a no one. Secretary of State. There you go. Well, I know a lot of activists in Maine. A woman named Mary Adams. They're active up there. And what they are hoping to do is split the liberal vote between the independent, whose name is King, and the Democrat. And that's right. And here's like a here's like a news broadcaster. And yeah, we'll we'll see. That's 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 the hope. You know, for 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 the Republican Party. Yes, sir. Getting Tea Party, uh, getting Tea Party friendly uh, people elected to Congress is the most important thing in my mind. But even if we give as many of them as we can, how do we get moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats to vote on? 
developed the web user on our on policies. How do we make those compromises? What should we be selling out on to get smaller <laughs> It, I mean, it's it's such a broad question, right? I mean, I mean, you, you have to. I mean, there is a practical element to this, and pe people say, people, you know, look at the 2010 election, which I talked about in my speech, and they say, well, you know, the the Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party cost us in Nevada and in Colorado and in Delaware, right? This is what they say. Okay, I can grant you, maybe that's the case, but without the Tea Party. 2010 doesn't happen. So th there's, there's a, and then there were Tea Party, huge Tea Party triumphs in 2010. Have you heard of Co Congressman Alan West, right? Have you heard of Senator Ron Johnson? Have you heard of Senator Marco Rubio, who took on an, esta an establishment kind of squish, right, in, in Charlie Crist? So some of, it, some of it has to do with picking, the broad principle I would say is pick fights wisely. Planting your flag constantly over and over again on every little thing is probably going to wear down the morale of everyone involved. It, it comes back to the question here. Principles versus practicality. Pick your fights. Pick it wisely. And I think the biggest fight that the conservative side picked in the last three years was the health care fight. And the fact of the matter is we lost legislatively, but we, we won the argument. We won the, the Washington Post has this blog, their big political blog is called The Fix. And they put out a headline on Thursday, and it was, the national debate on health care is over, Republicans won. And they showed all the polling data. And, I mean, it's Obamacare support is down in the latest AP poll to 33%. I mean, this is, this is a loathed, despised bill. And it looks like we maybe, depending on what five robed people do next week, uh, we might get another crack at that. But that was a fight worth having and absolutely just saying, nope. No chance. And when we talk about choices, you have to look at the way the parties voted. And I'll tell you, one of the parties, I'll let you guess which one, not one single vote for Obamacare in either house. Not one. Not one. From, from the most right-wing person to the most centrist rhino, not one. And I think it's important, when, when the stakes are that high, to stick together, which they, which they did, which they don't always do. A few more? One more, ma'am? <laughs> follow our principles and support the Constitution, we have a real problem with this election. Mitt Romney has yet to prove that he is a natural born citizen by the fact that either his grandfather, who had left with his polygamous Mormon family for Mexico and then returned, um, would have had proof of repatriation, or his father, George Romney, would have become naturalized on his return from Mexico, having been born there. Uh, and by age 21 in 1928, he would have completed his naturalization. So you, you're not sure if Mitt Romney is a, a, a U.S. citizen? By, by law and by the um, he was born here. of his family members. He was born in and Michigan. Now, he, he was, he's born here. He, he is a citizen. The issue is he's running for president. Is mm -hmm. he a natural born citizen? Yes, there are two types of citizens. There, there are two types of citizens okay. in this country. Okay. Done. I have many, many people have called, written to ask Romney to please provide proof of his status, either by the repatriation papers of his grandfather or the natural born uh, or the uh, nat naturalized citizenship acquired by his father at the age of majority. That would Age 21, and George Romney was 28. 28. Okay. George Romney ran for president in 1968. He withdrew from the campaign before he could be fully vetted. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. Well, George Romney, of course, isn't running for president. Mitt Romney's running for president. He was born in Michigan. Neither of these predecessors to Romney, either his grandfather or his father, could prove the document. Okay. Let, either one of them okay. Let me ask you. Can I? Do you dispute that Mitt Romney was born in Michigan? Of course not. Okay. Based on every court precedent, and you might disagree with the interpretation of the Fourteenth Amendment, but based on all of the precedent, if you are born on U.S. soil, you are a natural-born citizen. Some people don't. Agree, some people think it shouldn't be that way. But that. Hang on. That's the way it is. And there are two. I was. 
I was born in another country. I was born act, I, I, to American citizen parents, but there, you can either be a natural born citizen or a naturalized citizen. Mitt Romney was never a naturalized citizen because he didn't need to be because he was a natural born citizen. And I think, I mean, if, if you look at all the problems that the country is facing today, huge, huge problems, and you see the, t the two choices we have in November, and you, and you say, I don't know if I agree with the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, George Romney might have been born here, and did he ever get naturalized, and that's going to be enough to prevent you from casting a vote, I don't really know what to say. I know your point. That's, that's a real conundrum with all of this. Because you start allowing the Constitution to ebb away, it gets harder and harder to follow. I mean, what is our unifying purpose anyway. I think this I, I, yeah. will have to continue at, at I'll, I'll, time I'll, I'll end on this point, which is you and I might have a specific disagreement about this, but the idea that we need to adhere to the Constitution is something that I hope everyone in this room supports. So thank you. <laughs>